I'd love to uh, introduce uh, Catherine Burgio from uh, the US. She will talk about living with pelvic floor dysfunction and its psychosocial consequences. Uh, well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to come to Rio and talk about this very important subject of living with pelvic floor dysfunction and its psychosocial consequences. I have no disclosures related to this presentation. This happens to be a very broad topic um, encompassing many different pelvic floor disorders, each of which have unique symptoms and unique impacts on the people who suffer from them. Uh, so since we have limited time, I decided to just focus this talk on urinary incontinence, which seemed apropos given that this is the International Continence Society. In the words of one patient, incontinence is something, it doesn't kill you, it just takes your life away. So unlike many other conditions, incontinence, people with incontinence experience a, a very a different kind of impact on their lives because of the fact that this is a socially stigmatized condition. <laughs> it's okay to have high blood pressure, it's okay to have low vision, it's okay to have appendicitis, but it's not okay to leak urine. It's okay for babies to leak urine, but it's not okay for adults to leak urine. This is a socially based phenomenon that gets internalized in our psyches and leads to a sense of personal shame. It's, it seems to cross cultures, uh, it expresses itself differently in different cultures, uh, but it seems to be pretty universal. First, let's consider the psychological impact of incontinence. Um, there are many psychological impacts. We have, first thing that comes to mind is embarrassment, but we also have fear of embarrassment, fear of, of, of embarrassment coming up, self-consciousness. We worry about the next time that we're going to have an accident. People worry about whether they might have some wetness on their clothes. They worry about the odor, and they can get pretty preoccupied with this. They can live in fear of the next incontinent episode and develop anxiety around the condition as well as around just the sensation of urgency or even the smallest urge because indeed it is the precursor to the accident. The loss of control can be experienced as a loss of personal control over the body and this is generally an aversive feeling for uh, most people and it can lead to uh, a drop in self-esteem. The uh, one thing about the, the impact, psychological impact is that, as you would expect, it has huge individual differences in how people respond. Some people just put on a pad or not, and they go about their daily lives, and they just don't worry about it. Other people um, are become more despondent, um, can become depressed. Um, it can be a devastating thing for some people. Um, leading to more severe consequences. And this all depends on their basic psychological makeup, their personality, their coping ability, their coping style, their personal relationships, as well as several factors that are related to the, um, the condition itself, like the severity of the, of the symptoms. There have been several studies that have shown an association between urinary incontinence and depression. I haven't listed all of them here, but just uh, to, to give a couple of examples, there was one that showed that 30% of incontinent patients were depressed versus 17% of controls. But those with urge incontinence had a higher rate at 60%. In another study, urge incontinence was found to be um, more associated with depression than was stress incontinence. And this has been found across a number of studies. In fact, just the concept of urge and urgency seems to be a pivotal factor. Um, some would say that the, the difference is that the urge incontinence is associated with larger volume accidents, which are more embarrassing. Um, but then another school of thought is that it's the urgency itself, or that constant feeling of some bladder sensation or urge that's always on your mind and is uncomfortable. Uh, there was also a study that showed that the intensity of urgency was um, the strongest, had the strongest relationship to health-related quality of life, stronger than incontinence itself over incontinence as well as nocturia. Now turning now to the social impact of urinary incontinence, 
there's several of these as well. Um, it, there, this includes so exclusion from some social groups. People will avoid people once they learn that they have incontinence or notice it um, from the odor or so forth. It can strain family relationships, especially intimate relationships, and affect sexual function, sexual response. It can lead to reduced productivity, especially at work, and ultimately to social isolation. And then in certain people, it's a risk factor for nursing home placement. It's one, it, in one study, it was the second leading cause of nursing home admission. So uh, incontinence is a multidimensional uh, concept. Uh, its impact is multidimensional. And there are several modulating factors that have been noticed in the relationship between um, incontinence and its impact. Um, and some of them are listed here. Older women, for example, experience incontinence and its impact differently than do younger women. Um, there are gender differences. Um, there was a, an abstract yesterday that found differences um, in the impact between men and women, for example. So a culture, the culture that we live in, um, affects how we experience uh, incontinence, as well as our lifestyle, if we have a busier lifestyle. Uh, it, it can have a different impact than if we're a sedentary person and don't really do all that much. And then cognitive status and functional status um, are also modulating factors. Um, just to give an extreme example of the role of culture, um, this severe plight of these young women in certain parts of the world who develop fistulas after childbirth and are ostracized by their village divorced by their husbands and forced to walk long distances to reach a fistula hospital. Some of them don't make it. Some of them arrived quite malnourished and in need of rehabilitation, not because of the incontinence itself, but because of the social response to their incontinence. Now consider people with cognitive impairment, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Um, one of the impacts of dementia is that people are less aware of their condition. And so in this case, it, that can sort of mitigate the emotional impact. If you're not aware of something, it's not going to be upsetting you as much. But it has potentially greater uh, social consequences. It contributes to the decision to institutionalize. And it can be often the last straw for the caregiver. Uh, the caregiver who could manage several different problems that the person was having before, their activities of daily living, but when it comes to changing a diaper or managing their bladder problems, then it can be the last straw and they um, need to place them in an institution. Considering functional status, if you're otherwise healthy and you're getting around and you're independent like the woman on the left, uh, doing your own self-care. Um, you can manage incontinence easily, and it doesn't really, it may not impact your life that much. But if you're not able to take care of yourself and you're not able to manage your incontinence, this is when others get involved, and it really places you at risk for uh, being put in a nursing home. I want to bring your attention to a new uh, ICS publication the unspoken impact of urinary incontinence amongst women. Uh, this is on the ICS website, and it reports on the findings of a, of a study that came out this summer. Uh, it was a, a study that was led by Paul Abrams and the group at the Bristol Institute. What they did was an online survey of 1,203 women between the ages of 45 and 60 uh, from four different countries. And they looked at the um, symptoms that they were experiencing and the impact of incontinence. And these were all women with incontinence that are reporting on here now. Um, the measures included those of activities of daily living, uh, as well as some measures of mental well-being. And they particularly wanted to look at the relationship between the severity of their symptoms and the impact of the symptoms. So very interestingly, there were a large proportion of uh, respondents who reported that they had no impact or only slight impact from a number of uh, daily activities, social life, ability to visit with friends, their relationship with their partner, their sex life, family life, and, and depression. So it reminds us, as we know, that not everyone is suffering 
with incontinence, that there are many people living with it and who are not too distressed. But not unexpectedly, the story here is that the greater the severity, the greater the impact. And this was a pattern of, res of results that went across domains. So this uh, relationship between severity and impact held for activities of daily living, travel, ability to visit friends, personal relationships. There was a variable included that was this interference with everyday life uh, where that relationship uh, emerged as well and also uh, extended to uh, the variables that, that looked at mental well-being. So this is not the only study that's shown this. There's a body of literature on this uh, that's fairly consistent. Now, as you all know, urinary incontinence is underreported, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. Less than 50% of people with incontinence have reported it to their provider. Um, there's, there have been several years of research um, looking at different angles of treatment seeking and help seeking and this has held across the board. Um, this also is related to severity of the symptoms, but interestingly, even people with fairly severe incontinence don't always report it to their provider. In one study, patients who had large volume episodes on a daily basis, only 38% of them told their, their provider. Um, so it makes, a, makes us um, wonder, given all of these impacts, why don't people seek help? Um, this is a really interesting body of literature um, that includes several qualitative studies. So why don't they? Well, some people, they're just not bothered, as we mentioned, and certainly they have a choice not to, not to seek treatment, and we need to respect that, as we do with all patients. Some have the idea that they're not really incontinent, it happened a couple of times, or maybe several times, but um, it's probably not gonna happen again in their minds. Or they have it on a regular basis, but like many of us, they think, well, it's gonna go away, as, as so many things do. Uh, if you just wait long enough, it, sometimes it really does go away. It's common that they believe it's a normal part of childbearing. Uh, in some parts of the world, um, women consider it their fate uh, if they don't take care of them, themselves properly around childbearing. Uh, very common for it to be considered a normal part of aging. And the logic is, well, if it's normal part of aging and we can't control aging as much as we would like to and as much as we try, then it must mean that we can't control incontinence either. So there's this, in, in terms of the aging and the childbearing, there's a sense of fatalism. If I'm meant to be incontinent, then there's really nothing I can do about it. Um, one study that, that I'm aware of, they found that the most common reason uh, for not seeking treatment was they really didn't know treatment was available, uh, which is very interesting and probably less and less common with more messages to the public. And some are just too embarrassed to tell their doctor or their culture demands that they not. There are cultures where this is sort of a private family matter to be taken care of by family members and not something you would go to a health care provider for. It's seen as a social problem, not as a health problem. And then there's this large group of people who can manage it, and they do. And they do it using a number of different methods to avoid embarrassment. They uh, avoid leakage episodes using several different methods, and they also have strategies to hide leakage. So these are people who are, who are voiding frequently, basically to keep the bladder from filling, so if it's not full, you're less likely to leak. They do bathroom mapping, so if they have the urge, they can quickly find the, the place to go next. They restrict physical activity and social activity. And then in the realm of the hiding of the leakage, they're wearing absorbent products, Many were, you know, will pass on the absorbent product, but just wear dark clothing or bring a change of clothing, and they do things to manage odor. Um, the impact, uh, I mean, the adaptations um, have, uh, have an impact in, that is often included in the existing uh, quality of life instruments. Sometimes they, these measures include the adaptations just as part of the assessment of impact. But the uh, pelvic floor disorders network um, took a little different approach. Uh, the pelvic floor disorders network is a nine site network in the United States that's funded by the NIH, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Uh, and they set out to develop an index 
to measure self-initiated adaptive behaviors that are utilized by women with pelvic floor disorders of, of various kinds. And they did this uh, because they realized that adaptations mitigate the relationship uh, between severity and impact and can mitigate the severity of symptoms as well. And they wanted to enable the investigation of the use and the effects of these adaptive behaviors. Uh, so they went through several phases of instrument development and ended up with a final index with two domains, an 11 item avoidance domain and a six item hygiene demand, domain. So looking at the hygiene domain, you can see that bathroom mapping was the most commonly endorsed ad adaptive behavior. Two thirds of women in, um, reported that they used bathroom mapping. This was followed by carrying a survival kit with 60% with of people endorsing it and wearing sanitary pads napkins or pads with 55 percent and then there were several others and you'll notice here that those the, they, they studied different kinds of pelvic floor dis disorders and you'll notice that these are the most highly endorsed by those with incontinence but those with, whose primary problem is pelvic organ prolapse with some incontinence endorse them at, at lower rates a reminder that the impact of conditions is is uh, condition specific so moving on to the avoidance domain, um, the most highly endorsed uh, adaptation was urinary, urinating often, getting to the bathroom frequently to, to keep it from getting over full. 36% endorsed this. And then a very good number of, a uh, significant number of people reported that they wore easy to remove clothes, um, that they left home only at certain times, that they planned their daily activity. They limited their physical activities and their social activities, um, and they drank less. So these are all behaviors that people choose. They're not forced to do it, although they may feel compelled uh, to do it to mitigate the, uh, the effects of their incontinence. The adaptations do help to avoid embarrassment, and they minimize the direct effect of urinary incontinence, but we have to keep in mind that these adaptations have an impact of their own. And these impacts encompass economic issues, health issues, social and emotional issues. The mo one of the most obvious is just the economic impact of buying pads. We're all aware of the, the array of products that, that people purchase and how much they cost. There's several studies um, showing how many hundreds of dollars people spend every month and every year uh, for long periods of time for their absorbent protection. Uh, the, the, one of the more commonly adopted um, adaptations, the frequent voiding, um, is something that has potential health effects. Um, if you believe that urgency is the driving force behind frequency and that frequent voiding can lead to reduced functional bladder capacity, just because the bladder never really fills up to its full capacity and, can, and possibly can lose the ability to do that, which can, is also believed to re lead to overactivity and incontinence and more urgency. So there's this potential um, that this habit can actually exacerbate symptoms. Um, interventions like behavioral training with urge suppression aim to teach people to respond differently to urgency so that they don't have to go to the bathroom so frequently and they can have more control and, and break this cycle. Bladder training is another intervention also shown to be effective that does the same thing, teaches people how to control urgency so they can control when they go to the bathroom and the goal is to extend the voiding interval. Um, so go, the therapeutic direction is to go less often and to normalize the frequency of voiding. So it's easy to see how um, in, increasing frequency could uh, just perpetuate this vicious cycle and exacerbate symptoms. Uh, another commonly endorsed adaptation was the restriction of fluids, drinking less. Um, and this, of course, is something that we do therapeutically when somebody is in, uh, consuming an excess amount of fluids. But if it goes too far, like some people do with restricting their fluids, then they're risking dehydration, um, potentially d risking uh, urinary tract infection. Constipation can be aggravated, and it can increase the concentration of the of the urine as well, which um, some note is uh, it may increase the odor when there is leakage. Uh, the, act, the adaptations I find most compelling are the activity restrictions. 
because of the impact that they have on, the, on an active lifestyle and the benefits of that active lifestyle. Just think about not going out to meet your friends, something you've done, done for a long time, but you decide, well, this, the problem is just too burdensome, you're not going to meet your friends. There's this potential loss of social support if it happens on a regular basis. Not going to a birthday party or not going to a family wedding. Yes, you can look at the pictures, uh, but you don't really have the shared memories of the rest of the family. Not going to church is something I hear a lot. Um, this can have and be experienced as a spiritual loss, the, the loss of the, the ability to worship in certain ways. Um, not going out for a walk. This is particularly interesting because this is a, a very common form of moderate exercise. And as we all know, uh, there's growing evidence that exercise is omnipotent for preventing any number of chronic conditions. So you'd hate to see people lose the health benefits of exercise. I had a patient once who was a, a political uh, figure, a politician, and he was running for office and had an accident on stage. I'm sure you all have heard stories like this. He didn't want to risk that again, so he retired from public office, which was a loss to his career and a loss to his constituents. And then there's early retirement, the loss to the workforce and the loss of uh, people's roles and identities related to their, their work life. So when the burden of these adaptations gets great enough, we hope that people do come and, and uh, show up for treatment. There's a, uh, a good deal of evidence now uh, that people have been using health-related quality of life instruments that um, treatment does um, improve health-related quality of life. There are studies on surgery, behavioral and physical therapies, and medications. But we have to keep in mind that it also does include some burden of time, effort, and cost. We're all aware of some of the negative effects of uh, medications and surgery, um, side effects, adverse events, de novo symptoms. Um, but we can't leave out the conservative therapies. Think for a moment about the impact of reducing caffeine or telling a patient they just have to eliminate caffeine. It's very easy for the provider, but it's not so easy for the patient. And maybe that patient who has a long-standing habit of getting up in the morning and experiencing their first boost of energy by having their cup of coffee. Now maybe it's, it's perfectly okay and they get enough benefit that they're willing to do this, but still we have to remember it's changing a long-standing habit and it's, it's a loss. In a, a, it, even though it might be a small loss, it can be a loss to the patient's lifestyle. Similar for reducing bladder irritants. Very easy to hand patients a list of foods that they should not be eating because you think that it, it could be irritating their bladder. Um, and some patients are happy to do this, but for others there may be foods on there that are their favorite foods. And we get very attached to our foods and we get very attached to the foods that we prepare for our families. So it just uh, to be aware that this is not without impact. So what are the implications of all of this for uh, when we come to the point of evaluating our treatments, even whether in clinical practice or in research? Well, if we don't take these impacts into mind, then we're not going to get a complete assessment of the effects and the, the impacts of the interventions and how well they're affecting the patient's quality of life, for better or for worse. Um, it makes sense um, to us in general um, if we want to target a symptom and we have a new treatment, we're always looking for innovative treatments, new ways to reduce symptoms. Um, always there's in our mind that if we can reduce that symptom, then we're going to reduce the impact of that symptom and we're going to make people's lives better. Um, but the problem is if we only use symptom measures, even measures of symptom bother, we're not capturing all the impacts because um, symptoms and bother just, just don't cover all of the other impacts specifically. And it turns out that there is often discordance between measures of symptoms and measures of impact when we actually do the, the work. And it's very common to have little correlations between symptoms and impacts. Well, why would that be? Um, one thing is just that some of the negative impacts aren't captured in the symptom measures. But also, it sometimes happens that we're very good at reducing that target symptom, um, but the patient has other things going on um, and those have an impact as well. And if we don't address those, then they have this residual dissatisfaction with the treatment and residual impact. 
So just as an example, the 60-year-old woman that was in one of our studies, she was treated successfully with a behavioral program and a self-help booklet. She had 95% reduction in her incontinence, but she wasn't satisfied. And when we looked at her incontinence impact questionnaire, she had a 47-point increase. So something else was going on with her, which we had to address separately. So if we measure impact on quality of life, we are able to include the positive and the negative impacts of treatment, and this is highly recommended. What measures to use? Well, there's several ways to measure quality of life. We can do it in an interview. We can measure psychological factors like depression and anxiety. Um, bother is part of quality of life. But when you think about quality of life measures, is basically two types. There's the generic health-related quality of life measures and the condition-specific. And many of you are familiar with these. The generic are designed to assess outcomes in a broad range of populations so that we can compare impacts in the, in the population that we're looking at, like people with incontinence, to people who don't have incontinence, or to people who have another condition like diabetes, or to the general population. So it has a lot of flexibility that way. Um, and it's essential for doing those kind of comparisons. The problem is that it isn't that sensitive to change with intervention. On the other hand, the condition-specific quality of life instruments are pretty sensitive to change. These include like the incontinence impact questionnaire, the King's Health Questionnaire. They're designed to assess impact of specific conditions, um, specific to that condition that you're studying. So, um, where do you, how do you find a, a, uh, an instrument to measure impact and quality of life? There are so many uh, good validated measures out there and they're all very interesting and every, people have developed their own and uh, um, done really good work with them. But the, one of the limiting factors is that if everybody's using different measures, then it's hard to compare the results of studies. Um, so the ICI in uh, beginning in 1998 decided um, to help with the situation and develop universally applicable standards. They wanted to help guide the selection of questionnaires for practice and for research. So they began developing the ICIQ core questionnaire, uh, which has become a collection of questionnaires that have been reviewed and are recommended uh, for use. So this is one resource. Um, and then they've expanded the scope to include other urinary symptoms, bowel symptoms, uh, symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse, vaginal symptoms. So if you're looking for an instrument, um, you can go to their website, iciq.net, and you will find all of these great measures that have been reviewed and are recommended. Some of them are symptom and bother questionnaires, uh, but they have a whole group of, of quality of life and impact questionnaires uh, for lower urinary tract symptoms, for example, for OAB, for nocturia, and so forth. Um, so just in summary, um, incontinence is a multidimensional condition, it, and it has multiple impacts on, on the people who experience it. So it's highly recommended that, uh, whether in clinical practice or in research, that we evaluate our patients' lives and then the outcomes of our treatments using multiple domains. Of course, measure the symptoms. When appropriate, you use objective measures. Consider a measure of adaptive behavior if it's appropriate, but try to include um, a measure of impact on their quality of life. So uh, with that, I will conclude, and I thank you for listening. <laughs>